Okay, hi, hello. Just a quick question, who was yesterday on my session? Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more today about how we release the Pposh modules, the OVF and the tools and whatever we have in our backpack. So today's session is rather about getting some fun and how we ops benefited from the release pipeline in the first place. Uh, yeah, the question is, can you hear us without the speakers? Quite low. Because the problem is that when the speakers are on, the sound is off, kind of. So we, it's up to you whether you want us to turn on the speakers or do you hear us without. If there are so little people, just come closer. It will be easier for us, I think. There's some still plenty of space. Okay. I was supposed to give the session by myself, but uh, as we're, Tomek was supposed to, to file his request as well, uh, he missed two hours deadline. Uh, and because we are working on a subject together in our company, we're responsible for this for together. Uh, so we decided to, to give the session together as well. So welcome, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, we're going to tell you today the story about pipes uh, and how we love pipes and not the underground pipes. Anyway, a few words about us. We work as admins in a bespoke software companies, so we are responsible for giving environments to our developers that are running dev test environments for our clients. I mean, the software for our clients. So any environment our devs will need, we are to provide. And because of that, we consumed a lot of tech they're using and putting that into our own life cycle and daily blood for our modules. So, yeah, do my turn. Uh, but the problem is that I forgot my name. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. Like Mateusz said, uh, my name is Tom. We are working together for four years. Uh, I have been learning PowerShell for three years. Uh, Mateusz uh, talked, uh, talked me into PowerShell. Uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy our experience sharing. Okay. Some of you asked what the P means in the PPOSH. This is for Polish PowerShell user group, so all the modules are named after, after us. So we're going to leave a legacy. Anyway, uh, first let, let us ask some questions uh, so we can know better of you and what the audience is right now. Uh, who of you uh, writes only functions, not scripts? Only functions. Uh, who writes modules? Yay! Yeah. Uh, who likes to create new modules? Yeah, it's Yay. fine, okay. Uh, who knows any uh, continuous integration or continuous deployment tools? Yay! A lot. Uh, <clears throat> who, uh, is there anyone who doesn't know Git? GitHub Git Yay. tool? Okay. Uh, who knows what re release pipeline is? Great. Who use it? Yay! Yeah. Awesome, okay. not that bad. Okay, we're going to tell you our experience with the release pipeline, what tools we are using in the daily uh, work we have. We're going to show you the open source projects we're using. We're going to show you... Yep? Can I ask, why is it called pipeline? The release pipeline, because we start with something simple and we deliver, we code, we deliver, we build, and we deliver that to the end server. So there are a few steps uh, from the beginning to the end, and it's called release pipeline. This is not our term, we just incorporate that. Uh, anyway, we're going to show you the tools that you can use, the tools that are free, the tools that you can uh, use in cloud, like AppVeyer, or you can use on-premise, like TeamCity. We're using that as a free source as well. And, and that's it. So, Okay, uh, so uh, <coughs> when you look at this uh, picture, uh, try to imagine scripts, and I will talk. Uh, do you know that a human psychology reaction to a problem is divided to five steps, five uh, stages? Negation. Uh, no, there is no math. I know every, where is my every script. I know what, it's, uh, what it does. I know where it's going. Uh, anger. When we must do something fast, where is the fuck is it? <laughs> Negation. Uh, negotiation. Uh, Tomek, put yourself uh, together and clean it up. Depression. I have, ma uh, I have made a mess again. 
I will never clean it up. Uh, maybe it's the best way to delete it all. And acceptation, and it's the worst state because we can stay in the state a bit longer. Uh, we, act, we think that nothing, we, will, not, we can change nothing. <clears throat> okay. We start uh, from the, we start our story from the last step. <laughs> That's me. Uh, uh, the situation with the scripts is, I think, because when we start to learn a new language, we took some code, we modify, we test it, uh, we have some circumstances, so we create new version, we must do something on different servers, so we create another versions, and uh, we have plenty of versions, and if we have, I don't know, 20 uh, members in a team, everyone have uh, the central repo, call it folder, and inside it we have plenty of scripts, and, and it's becoming a nightmare. Trust us, we've got 20 plus members in our team, and we started that everyone had the same script in a different name, in a different version, doing the same thing for different servers, and yeah, no. You know, you won't gonna go that way. So there was a time that we had to fix that, uh, basically because we had like 30 people joining us every day, every month, sorry, as a company, and we had to provision those users, computers, etc. So we asked for help. We went to our developers, uh, we tried to mind the gap, and we asked them, how can you help us? Because they were already using the release pipeline in the software development they were using. They introduced us with this model. We tweaked it a little bit. We started small. We started with a central code repository. It was SVN. It was nearly four years ago right now. So the Git was just starting the traction in our company. Then we used our, for, for coding, we used our favorite PS editor, it was ISC, no Visual Studio Code then. Some of us used ISC on steroids. They were happy. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this was the beginning. Then we stole in the SVN, later came Git. So finally we had one central repository for all the scripts, but without the rest of the tools like TeamCity building the scripts and then deploying to the end servers, it wouldn't be any difference between just a shared folder on a file share. Because when you put some scripts into the repository and you don't do anything with that, it's just the file share. So we were using TeamCity to grab the scripts, the functions built in a module, and put them on the server that we were managing. So we had our console, we had our management servers that all our IT members were ripping to, and from there on we just managed all our infrastructure. So what we wanted to achieve as well was to incorporate some rules, incorporate uh, rules coding to all our members. So after we got the module, the, the model, sorry, for, um, for the release pipeline, we thought about additional benefits we can get from this model. Uh, so thanks to this transformation, we got, uh, uh, we achieved more. Uh, per script analyzer uh, become our script cop. He uh, was our guardian to do better coding. We are not programmer, so we are learning. Uh, the co uh, work, uh, central repo uh, <coughs> help us to code in one place and to deploy the scripts to every server we need to. Common build tools, common standards for every module, common standard for every function, like help, like naming, and we're going to show you that later. Pester, pester test, so we are ready for pester. We have a sp uh, folder when you can put your test. We will do it yeah, we're when we it. learn it. <laughs> and uh, common utilities, utilities, so one of us can find and learn some, I don't know, for example, Porsche uh, poor RS jobs. He can uh, learn it, rec uh, in implement it, teach me, teach our team how to use it, and we have... The thing is that what Script, script Analyzer and in the beginning Script Cop did was because enforcing certain rules, like every function had to have synopsis, had to have the help, 
because else it wouldn't be pushed into, into the production server. Uh, because it had to follow the guidelines like no aliases, no things like that. Anyone could write a function that would follow the rules, and all the others, it was easy for them to just get help new command or get command from the module because we've got plenty of commands, and it was impossible to track all of them. So enforcing this kind of rules helped us to share the knowledge within the team that was a lot of different people working in a different ways. So we came up with a model for our modules. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the module is open source, whether we have our closed source modules, they have the same structure, which is easier to create a module in the first place, but also to find functions inside. So they've got the build folder. Inside, you find all the scripts that are needed for the build procedure, whether the CI is a TeamCT up there, it doesn't matter, or your local machine. Then we've got the, uh, the module itself with private and public functions, and also the test folder where we put all the generic tests, as you can see. And also, if we are ready to prepare some tests for our functions inside of the modules, they get each, each function get its test file and put into the test utilities in here. So this is how we started. Uh, so do you know uh, per script analyzer? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great tool. It's help uh, to do right things in uh, now in uh, VS, uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, in it helps uh, on the fly to write the code. It provides help. Uh, when we do some uh, crazy stuff, for example, in, uh, I don't know, if statement we uh, write equal then dash, it says, are you sure? Well, it's wrong. The thing is, have you ever refactored someone's code from the internet, from your teammates? Okay, do you usually write the same way the brackets with the new lines? So what's your first thing when you do when you get a script from someone? Yeah, and this is why we use VS Code uh, mainly with the script rules. So every project from us have the VS Code folder with other rules incorporated. So if you just put a script, put a function inside the projects and you do the control alt f so the format document, it will just use the same formatting we use across all the functions within the module, and your function will look just the same as all the others. And that helps a lot in reading and troubleshooting and debugging in the later process. And Bias Script Analyzer has over 50 rules, and well, it's uh, open source, so everyone can uh, write your own rules. Yeah. Anyone of you been on the uh, breakout session on lunch with a Bias Script Analyzer here? Yeah. yeah, good stuff, anyway. So, before we dive in, do you know Plaster? Okay. Anyone use Plaster? Yay! Well, I incorporated that lately into our modules uh, before we had an instruction. If you want to get a new module, copy this folder, rename this files, rename this folder, get into those files, rename those lines within those, those functions, and then put into the build folder. No. Uh, with Plaster, which is a fancy way of copy-pasting uh, files and replacing on the fly all the variables you need to put into, you just give a template, I'm going to show you later to those interested. Uh, it's also available on our GitHub. So you give a template, you just invoke Plaster, the folder with the template, and the operator has to answer a few questions. You're going to see that in a moment. So we've adapted that, and finally we have our modules created in a certain way. Uh, we're going to start with the basics. We're going to show you from the very beginning to the very end how the release pipeline works. This is creating a new module on GitHub. Nothing fancy, we give it a name. As you can see, I'm creating that at a people's group, not me. So this is a team's profile. So I'll have to give my own permission. Uh, it's a public, it's with readme, it's with mid license. This is important. If you don't put license, effectively no one can use your code because they can be sued by the legal department. So right now I'm uh, inviting myself my own account to collaborate on this repo. The films are edited, so you don't have to wait for the internet connection or things like that. So we've got the repo, we've got the collaborators. I'm creating a wiki page. Anyone of you uses wiki page on GitHub? 
Yeah, I'm going to show you in a moment how to create an automated wiki pages for all your functions that have synopsis inside. So this is just a plain wiki page. And that's it. Yay. Now the second demo, how to create a module. Uh, this is using the plaster right now. So we've got our module. Uh, I know the letters may be a little bit too small. I have all the functions inside, so later I can zoom it in. Effectively, we're cloning the repository to our own folder on our machine, and then just pointing where the template file is. As you can see, I've got plus the template folder uh, above. There's a bunch of XML files. Now, it asks me within Visual Studio Code for my name, uh, because I'm using a GitHub repo, and Visual Studio Code knows that. He takes my name as, as an auto, defaultly. I can change that anyway. I need to just give the name of the module in the description. Now it asks me whether I want to put public, private, and configuration default empty folders into the module. Should I add Git support and pest the tests? Should I add people's build support tools so that any AppVay or TeamCity or whatever can build my module from, from the very beginning? Should it ask Visual Studio Code support, so the folder with the settings with script analyzer rules? It conflicts with the readme file because I cloned it from GitHub. So it creates a different copy. I will have to delete it in a moment. And I have my module up. That's it. With all the files inside already populated with the proper name I gave, with all the proper files, all I need to do is I grab the GUID of the newly populated module and replace it in the test file. What this test will do effectively if you mess up with your functions. So your function file will have a different name than the function itself. During building, it will check how much files you have in your folders and how much functions you export. And if the number differs, it's going to bail you. And if that, the release pipeline won't send the module to the server down. So this helps us a lot. OK. Now how to create a Git repo? For our internal projects, we use uh, Git. Uh, it's not rocket and science either. We hit new re repository, uh, give it a name, give it a description. It's important to check the include readme because we, can, we can't clone an uh, empty repository. And there was a URL for our repository. OK, and we're going to do it the same. We've got the templates as well for our internal modules. Because we're using TeamCT and a bit of legacy still behind us, we need to add two additional files to deploy. Effectively, what it does, it will be the same as before. Effectively, what the deploy does, because our servers, our production servers, not all of them, have the internet access, it wouldn't be possible to download all the prerequisites model from the internet. So what we do while we build that on the agent or local machine, we grab all the uh, required modules. You're going to see that in a moment as the PSD pen will kick in. Uh, so we grab all the modules, we build a zip package, and that package is being delivered to the end server and unzipped in a destination folder. That is, thanks to that, we don't have any uh, modules that don't work because they have prerequisites that are not on the end server. So again, delete the readme. As you can see, it replaced the demo module, the name of the module, with the variables that were in the template. So effectively, creating a module is like five seconds work right now. Just give it a name, fire it up. Git commit, git push, and that's it. Yeah, sure. I, I don't really understood why you have to change it to the tests. Because the test, the, the file that goes into the tests is a template, so it's a random GUID. So once I deploy the new module, I need to replace that. I didn't figure out how to do it on the fly yet. Because the plaster new module uh, functions don't have the parameter GUID, so I cannot pass it over into plaster parameters. So. What's the magical thing in the build scripts? What does it do? In the first step, it configures the Nugget repository on the host that is being run, whether it's your machine, your agent, your uh, virtual machine, whatever you run it. For that, uh, this is when, for example, you get a brand new machine, like we sometimes do. And it hasn't been touched, it's just a vanilla. So you need to configure the PowerShell gallery. You'd have to, you have to configure that it's trusted. 
and get the initial modules from that. This is the first step, the configure nugget thing. Then it installs the PSD pend open source module, which resolves the dependencies based on PSD file for your module for build and run, grabs all the information from the PS gallery. It can also create files for you. It can copy files from your internal share during the process. So thanks to this, I won't have to resolve anything by myself. If I put, for example, that my module requires PESTA 340, it will grab the PESTA 340 from the PowerShell gallery and put it into my server. If I require a higher version, I just put that into requirements and it will do it for me. I won't have to do it by myself. Then goes the build dependencies. To build a module, in our case, we require a script analyzer, we require a depend, we require build helpers, we require PESTA. So these are the build dependencies, so all the modules that are required effectively to build the module. Then goes the project dependencies. So for example, I create a new module called OVF Diagnostics DHCP, and that is requiring PIPOSH OVF, and in fact PIPOSH tools, and PIPOSH SQL tools. So I put that into project dependencies, and during the build process, the PES depend will grab those from the internet, or from my gallery, or private, or from my repo, and put them into the package for the server, so I won't have to think about it by myself. Also, it acts like as a documentation. What else modules does your project require instead of PSM, uh, PSD uh, manifest? Then goes the set build environment. Anyone heard about build helpers? The module, open source as well. Build helpers? Okay, this is uh, an awesome project uh, that effectively creates all the variable environments you require to run a project. The what dependencies as well. What the magic, what it does is, is it knows whether you're running Abveo, TeamCD, you're running Jenkins, you're running Travis, and all of those CIs requires different variables. What it does is it abstracts the module, the, the name of the module, the path of the module, the localization of the module, because, for example, Abveo has its own folder. TeamCity puts on the agent in its own place. Jenkins uses different place. And it would be a nightmare to have a built file for every CI in the world. Build helpers fix that. It just extracts from the environment all the variables and creates global variables for the runtime of the build process. So this is the thing. And then goes invo invoke Sake. Sake is also an open source project. It's a task sequencer. So once we have all information in place, we, we define tasks inside. Initialization, so grab the environment variables that build helpers created and use that in this task sequence. Then go for tests. All PESTA tests that are within the module being run, being, you know, the module being tested, if there are any additional tests for functions that are also being run, and again, Build Helper uh, knows which environment it runs. If it's local, it will just dump the XML file. If it's in Abveo, Abveo requires the XML with the tests to be uploaded to a certain site. It does that for us. So I can see in Abveo that the test for the module. Then goes the build process. Effectively for PowerShell, building means replace the module version, just bump it up, and export all the functions that you want to export. You don't have to put it manually. So every function you put into public folder will be populated during the build process in the file and saved as an artifact, whether it's going to go for GitHub or PowerShell Gallery. Then the static code analysis, so script analyzer runs again and checks whether there are any issues with aliases, uh, any rules you're going to put. We also have a file within the module saying, okay, these are the rules that we want this project to comply to. You can modify that, you can add yourself, and then during the build process, it will check, okay, in our environment, we like the curly brackets to be at the end of the line, and then a new line following a new line. Your environment may be different. Just put those rules into your script analyzer file. Then goes the regenerate wiki. This is the function from people's tools. Uh, basically, it looks into all public and private functions folder, imports them, grabs the synopsis and creates a markdown file for each function and uploads to the app here, to the GitHub. So if I run the build locally on my machine, I will have the wiki pages. I just have to push it to GitHub and I have the documentation ready. Uh, 
And then the zip, if it's, if it's in team city, so I don't change anything else. If it's in team city, it creates a zip package for, for team city to deploy. So right, we've got all, we've got all the prerequisites uh, to summarize. Get up. We store the code, we commit, we use all the features of the GitHub, like pull requests, my requests, branches. We're learning that. We're ops, remember, we're not devs. Then we've got Upveyor as our worker, as our dwarf that does the heavy lifting, does everything what's required. And then if the release on the GitHub was tagged, it pushes our new release to PowerShell Gallery. So what an admin task is, what, what I have to do, I have to write a code, and I have to commit it. That's it. So we're going to show you that. Uh, I have Upveyor already prepared. If you want to look how, you can find it on my blog, how to prepare Upveyor to work with your GitHub account. Effectively, here I'm creating a new project for our demo module that we created a moment ago. It's a rocket science. You're going to see that in a moment. I'm changing the build number to... Uh, I will be using that to populate the manifest while it's uploading. Abveyor requires to point into YAML file because my build process is a different one than the default one. So within the module, I have a YAML file. I'm just pointing the path. I'm directing Abveyor for this build, for this project. This is your YAML file. Build it that way. And it's all generic. You don't modify a thing in that, in that file. And we've got kicking in Abveyor. Uh, it's been queued. It takes a few seconds before the build starts. You'll see that the build helper starts uh, with installing the scripts. At first, the build PSC one is invoked. We've got PowerShell Gallery uh, prepared. We've got PES depend. This is how it looks like. It has marked that all the latest version of script analyzer, PESTA, and build helpers, and sucker and something else has to be downloaded from the gallery. You see the output of the build helpers uh, information, the PESTA test for the module. Now it's running the static code analysis based on my PSD file and says, okay, your GitHub deployment has been skipped because you didn't tag your file, your commit. So it tested, it said everything's fine with your commit, but I'm not doing anything else with it. So let's fix it. Uh, I'm, I'm in this moment putting some functions into the module locally, copying three files effectively. Git add, git commit, git push. And that's it. Right now you can see the green icon on Upveyor, and in a moment it's gonna go blue. Upveyor right now sees there was a change in GitHub repo, so it's gonna prepare a VM for me again. It's gonna use as a title my commit message. As you can see, same thing again. So it's like never happened before. Why? Because Upveyor creates a new VM for every build and then destroys that. There is a pool of VMs running, so when you, and it's free for open source projects. So if you run your build, it just assigns a newest machine that's available in the pool, and you have to prepare your machine yourself. There are also templates like Visual Studio, so it knows it will be Windows with PowerShell. Lately, they also accept Linux machines, so you can build Linux, something new. Now, all tests are good. I'm creating a tag. It's 03 because I was testing before for 02 for the purpose of the demo. So it's 03. I'm publishing the release. Yeah, GitHub got, gone wild. So you can see there's the release 003. Upveyor again sees the blue. He sees the tag version. And if you go on the tests tab in here, you're just going to see the output of Pester and any tests you had. So it's just a quick view. Yeah? Is, it, is this a webhook or something like that? Yes. Yes, Upveyor has a webhook for GitHub. So it, it's uh, explained on my, on my blog. So it sees whether the, uh, the, the repository changes, then pulls, clones the repository based on the last commit. And because it ha GitHub also has the webhook, it can push back all the changes. So the zip file, the artifact, back to, to GitHub. You can see PowerShell Gallery was uh, up updated with the newest module. We can find it there. Hooray! Yay! We've got 003 version. 
And if you check GitHub, it gonna, it's going to be uploaded with the zip file. People demo zip. So this is the newest release. So as you see, the only thing I did, git push on the, on the files. So how to create a wiki? There's going to be a rocket science. Uh, you're going to see one weird thing. I'm running without local administrator rights, my account. So I will need to run, uh, because I will have to download some modules from the internet. And this is, this is a good thing. You have a new machine. You have a new employee. You give him the module. He starts the build. And he will have all the modules in his machine automatically. You don't have to tell him, install this, install that, install that. It will just get into his maze. So I'm running a PowerShell as admin. I'm cloning the repository of Wiki, uh, which is effectively the same link as your repo, just the Wiki appendix. As you can see, it's empty, has only two files, side by and home. And I'm running the build. It will look the same as running in AppVair, because it's, run, it's using the same scripts. It's not an AppVair machine. It has different folders, different locations, and it acts the same. Right now, the generating, generating markdown function kicked in, got all the functions, create files, as you can see in API. Again, git push to the repository, and I will see wiki page. I need to move to that repo. And git push. Yay, we've got... He asks me for my credentials because I'm running on a different account. That account doesn't have the GitHub configured. And that's it. You can see we've got four pages. It isn't very user-friendly, so we're going to fix that. We're editing the home page. I don't know how it works. It just works. Just put that with your module name, save it, and you've got functions link linking to your module with the help. This is the brief description you put into synopsis of your function. If you put any parameters, parameters set, any advanced, and you click on that page, it will just roll over like Microsoft Docs site. I won't surprise you um, with anything new talking about our closed source modules. And I think it's our su success. It's all about, it's, that's all about. Uh, everything should be simple, should be generic, uh, without any stress situation, any new tools. So GitHub is replaced by the Git. Uh, AppVair is replaced by TeamCity. Okay. So. Uh, so now we have a Git repo. Mateusz, Mateusz just uh, cloned their new repo created by Plaster, and now we're gonna to, we're gonna uh, uh, um, set uh, Team City to check the repo and do the things. In this template, there are two very important uh, scripts: uh, build pass one and deploy pass one. The script, yeah, we are. I will show you the simplest way. Uh, the simplest way to create a new project is to copy. It's to clone. It, yeah. It's to clone. We will change uh, the project name. And we need to cha uh, change uh, the artifact uh, name. The artifact is zip file, which is built uh, according to instruction in build pass one. Uh, script. So it will use the name uh, with the build, it will use the name of the module. Team City can have different names for simplicity, some simplicity we use kind of same. In this artifact we have all dependency, all uh, modules we are depend on, binaries and everything uh, which, in, which are included in build uh, PS1 script. So we change uh, in deploy step also the uh, artifact dependency uh, name. So the difference between AppVeo and TeamCity here is that we not only built the module like AppVeo did, AppVeo did push it to Gallery and GitHub, TeamCity will push it to our servers. Now we need to uh, configure uh, VCS. VCS is uh, version control settings 
to our version control system. So we choose the uh, repository type, it's Git, we name it, Uh, we specify the URL of the repository and we choose a user who can get into the repo and it's only for clone uh, um, read only read on so read this only is properties demo purpose in production every repository every agent has its own account that has rights to the proper repo so it's no no credentials running anyway. And now we, are, we have created new project connected to our new repository. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Now time to deploy. Okay, so let's check it out. If we settings up things right, I use uh, GUI, so we commit the changes. It can be new function and can be like this uh, changed functions. Uh, when we commit and we hit uh, two times the f files, we see the changes. So before committing and check in the GUI, it's, it's tortoise. Yeah. GUI, anyway. We write something about why we change things. Usually. Usually. We didn't write what we changed because it's, we, we can find it in the uh, uh, log. Uh, in the log. And after a few minutes, uh, Team City sees uh, f uh, see the changes, sees the uh, repository, and start uh, building uh, the pro the project. As you can see, there's the time bar based on previous builds for the project. Team City assumes how much time this build gonna take. So it's really an awesome feature if your build takes like a few hours. You know what to do in the meantime. Like in Upveyor, we have a console view. So we can see everything it's happened inside. So when uh, we write function, use write host or our write uh, log function to see uh, what is happen happened and where we are now. As you can see, PS depend build helpers looks just the same. It doesn't matter what your CI tooling is; it just should work. You saw the error. The error was because there was no test files, and uh, Team City complained that there is no, well, the build, Saka, in fact, complained there was no XML file it's going to upload to Team City. So that's it's why it failed. And, and at the end, we saw how uh, Team City deployed the module on to the servers using deploy pass one script. So basically, the Team City is a server that has all the configuration in it. Then there's the, the agents, the plain VMs we spin up, not so regularly as up there, but also destroy them and spin them up, connect them to Team City. Team City then has, sees the job that the Git repo changes. It asks its agent to clone the repo, do whatever needs to be done, and then using the deploy, the PSC, the PowerShell continuous integration tool written by our friend, it pushes all the information to the servers. Using PSC is quite better than using invoke command because we can deploy up to 2000R, 2008R2. We can deploy that using side-to-side -side VPNs using only HTTPS protocol 443. We don't need to have the open uh, remote PowerShell on the end server to deploy packages like that. And now TeamCity is for free for 100 uh, settings, for build settings. And three agents. Three so you can have yeah. three VMs spinning with your build. We want to try uh, VSTS. It's some, in some circumstances, it's also for free. So, so yeah. we, we have three tools, three, 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 three tools. Three possibilities, and the build files will look just the same. The beginnings were rather simple. We didn't have, as you can saw, a few projects. We just had one file. Yeah, we started uh, a release pipeline as a uh, other update. Uh, why we chose that? Uh, because we have many updates. We have uh, over 500 updates uh, on other users uh, per ma uh, per week, and we have uh, we have uh, almost 60 steps in leaving uh, if users are leaving our company. So it was uh, time consuming. Uh, I started the project uh, 
uh, living employee and uh, our colleague, uh, our developer colleague, uh, Marcin Grzywa, uh, started and showed us uh, on this example uh, at the update, uh, update user and new, new uh, users. Uh, so he, we have uh, uh, SVN repo then. He created for us for our first uh, Team City project. Uh, he showed us how it works. Uh, and uh, we did all the stuff on one server. It was our console uh, and everything else. Yeah, so it started small. Uh, the thing is that we didn't want to update the Active Directory anymore. Uh, we just got the CSV file from the HR with all the users, whether they were working, whether not, whether they were already employed or should be employed in like two or three months. And we wanted Team City or automation in general to take all the shifting from us. So based on the CSV file that we had to commit into the repo, Team City created accounts, enabled accounts, created all the groups, etc., etc., etc. It took him three weeks starting zero to the Objectivity Admin Tools module, doing all that. He's an awesome guy. So, a demo of the simple file watcher. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, right then, the scariest part was to uh, set up uh, Team City, but uh, to watch only one file, but right now it's simple as... As it can be. As it can be, so we... Uh, connect to uh, S4 and repository, the same as we did before with Git. With Git, and we tell to Team City that he should uh, look into only one folder. That the folder is configurations at employees, and then create out of this folder an artifact called AD employees that we'll refer later in the builds. So only changes in the folder uh, fires up the Team City project. Uh, the project is consists of two steps. One step is copying the, fi the CSV file which uh, HR are give us to our server, and second step is uh, running all all the needed function which uh, modify uh, add which gives uh, permissions, add user to group, add license. You're gonna see in a moment that. There's no just point and click. I mean, if the HR makes a mistake, the validation of the CSV will kick in before any changes are made to the Active Directory. So it runs through all the entries in the CSV file to check whether the column date is in proper shape, whether the uh, strings, for example, for ID are in a correct shape. And if not, it's going to tell us in the Team City console in a readable form for support that something's wrong in this file, in this line, and you're going to fix it. So it gives us all information to fix the issue in the first place. Basically, what that gives us, we don't have to do it. The support required to commit the file and support required to fix it. As you can see, it's, uh, we have to only commit the file which was given us and the whole magic is going under the hood. Should kick in? Yeah. No. Like I said, we can see and investigate all the steps, everything what has happened. And we can check why some steps failed. Like, I, like we see, there are no changes on the infrastructure. Team City also gives us information who fired up the commit to the SVN, who initialized the whole process so we can chase him, for example. And we see that uh, in column, in some column there's a string which was not meant it, to be. It was supposed to be starting with EMP, employee number, and it was EMO. Well, we don't have EMOs in our company, so we have to fix that. Because one, one of the steps is uh, validate the data in the uh, CSV. Okay. Done? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, now we are a bit further uh, in this uh, the update release pipeline. We use Git, uh, still we use uh, TeamCity, but now we have many more projects. 
We have uh, many servers. We have production servers. We have test servers. We have uh, we de divide uh, our pr uh, project to uh, dev project, so we can test our function on test environment. We have uh, servers that with uh, no RDP, uh, where we fire schedule task and all the things we are doing in uh, Team City. So we build module in Team City. We provision whole machine. We create VM. We, we install all needed things. We configure uh, all systems, and, and it's done automatically for us. So, so yeah. <laughs> now, <I could. laughs> later on, <laughs> need to hurry up. So, as we can see, from We've, one project we have, and we are ops. Remember, we are not devs. We the, have that automated in here, and this is the UI, the experience for our support as well. We are not being called to every change that failed. They can do it themselves. Yeah. Test console with installing on the needed commandlets, uh, binaries. I like to break them. I like to break things. So Tomek had to find out a way to rebuild a console for us every now and then. And we just fire up a new vanilla VM, uh, edit the settings in the project stating this is the new VM you're going to configure, just fire the build. All required tools for the console that our admins are using are just building from the VM, from the Team City, sorry. Yeah. Right now, we are, oh, I am showing that uh, we, we, be, we are building uh, task schedules. Team City can build task schedule for us. We are using uh, tests for this. And uh, we create a password in a fly, uh, which are using to create uh, task schedules deployed on management server, where RDP is disabled and we are uh, the access is uh, restricted. So as I showed yesterday, we've got the OVF module, uh, and I'm not creating the tasks manually. S sorry. And only uh, one thing is needed to create new task. You need to copy uh, the block change names and commit the uh, JSON file. After a few minutes, we have new scheduled task on a management server. Because it's running functions, and functions are within our modules, and modules are deployed to our servers. We don't need to copy any script files or anything like that. It just Mateusz happens. can uh, delete uh, VM, and after, I don't know, half an hour, I have new VM with all the settings. OK. so. There was a few roadblocks on the way. Uh, the first is and was and still is when we have new people joining us. Uh, you don't have to use your folder on your machine to store your scripts. Just start contributing to our central repository. This is how you work. Yeah, it's fun something for me. Not every commit should go to master, especially when it's 100 uh, sure. I did it two times and I have two days to recover from that is, the field. <laughs> uh, and from then on, we have the test consoles, where we put the test branch or the dev branch of our modules to, to test it first. So uh, the next thing is, uh, you know the thing, I have to do something really quick. So you know, I've got the script. It has only a few hundred lines, but it does the job. Can you refactor that for me? Hell no. <laughs> So this is something we need to learn ourselves and learn our people, our members. Uh, start small. So in a summary, uh, we have people's built tools, which depend on free open source projects. And oh. we are using it, people's yeah. tools too. Yeah, so the thing is that build tools is a generic thing. And we don't have to create the wheel from the start when we create a new module. It's then on our GitHub. Yeah, and it's on our GitHub. You can just clone it and use it. It's generic. It has no names in it, so just fire it up. Then we've got the Pepos tools and SQL tools built upon the build tools, uh, also available on our GitHub. Uh, the Pepos tools has a lot of nice features and functions. Uh, JSON uh, operations on files, PSD files, uh, get validate credentials, so you validate the credentials before you use them. So, for example, when you have a function that requires a credentials or a script. If you fire that function up, it will validate the credentials before you start the execution, so you know everything's fine. Before you block your account. 
for example, for a few of them. SQL tools, this is also built by Marching Jiva. What it allows us is to interact with the SQL server without any dependencies. No PS, no SQL tools management, no, no nothing. It just uses pure.net to communicate to a SQL server, which is quite fine in some situations. And main pro of people's tools is write log. It's a function. It's very talkative. Yeah. Uh, like you see, uh, the, uh, the output was on a console, but using one switch, you can uh, stream all the output in the file or you can uh, into the event log. We want to write, uh, uh, to, uh, write uh, things in SQL. Well, the thing is, we kill a lot of puppies. Uh, write log is based on write host, um, basically because CI tooling doesn't like output, uh, write output. And we didn't want to populate the output with the text, with the verbos. If anyone tried in version 2 or 3, <laughs> this is legacy stuff. Anyone tried to uh, redirect uh, verbos into the default output that the CI tooling requires, good luck. That is why we're using RyLog, which uses write host underneath, if you tell the write log to put in the console. If you use set log context, let's set log configuration before you run anything, and point it to file, all those informations you have in your script, write log, write log, write log, will go into file. If you have an event log, it will go into event log. So without changing your functions, without changing your code, just one switch before the execution, and you have verbose logging of your choice, file, event log, or console. That is why it's so awesome. On top of these two modules, we built our uh, open source and closed open modules. Open source and closed modules. We have now over five. Well, in numbers, uh, yeah. Sorry, you can get it on our people's group GitHub. Everything's open sourced. Uh, in numbers, it's quite overwhelming for us, for the ops. Remember, the open source modules have over six thousand lines of code. Yeah, sure. One third of that is synopsis and help. That helps. And for closed source, we've got almost 55,000 lines of code for our internal modules. So this is, this is our code we run daily using TeamCD as well. Because we like to build new modules <laughs> thanks to Mateusz <laughs> and Plaster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the numbers are nothing, but to me are impressive. Uh, before Mateusz did the summary, I didn't know I did so much coding. Half of it is his. <laughs> Yeah. Now let's consider our achievements and benefits from uh, incorporating with developers. So first one is uh, SQL logging. So we have uh, everything logged into uh, SQL structure and uh, it's standardized. So yeah, within our objectivity closed source soon coming to open source module, we've got the add change log function. And the only thing the operator has to do is to put... At the end, use... At, yeah, at change lock, and then everything he did goes into a SQL database, which gives us a lot of nice features like Power BI reporting or uh, point in time changes that was made, or get lock, get uh, lock, get change lock, get change lock, where you can get all the changes made by user to a user, by an instance, to a machine, to a group, whatever you like. And the reason of the changes? Because the one of the Fields. mandatory parameter is ticket from Jira. Yeah. Another thing is the shared repo. Uh, yeah, shared repo with all the goodness, uh, like branching and versioning, so we can uh, go back to a uh, working copy. Try <laughs> to do that with a folder. <laughs> so the common knowledge, uh, what we understand underneath is that we've got three ninja, PowerShell Ninja in a team of nearly 30 people. But all of them are using PowerShell daily. There is no day that you walk by any of those machines and you don't see PowerShell up and running. They are using that, they're using all the modules and scripts, they barely do any manual tasks that were not automated. For example, deploying a new machine. It just press F2 on a machine and everything's done underneath with the WDS, thanks to this guy. And then the support just need to get a machine and put it into desk. Uh, so, and everything is logged into the SQL so they can check what's the status of the user. As Tomek said, we've got the employee flow. That's like 60 steps right now for a new employee. And everything which is automated is being logged into SQL. So for example, I did 15 steps and got sick. He takes over. 
he get change lock and he knows where I finished. He doesn't have to go to the Jira. Well, he can because it's also automatically, automatically updated based on the change lock. So that's how it works. And because the per script analyzer, the way we write the functions, the way we enforce users to write, our operators to write the functions, I can open any function and I can understand it because it has help. If it doesn't have help, I have a sword. And I'm going with the sword to the operator and he will put the help into the function. And the continuous deployment, uh, there is no more manual copying files from server to server. Imagine having 10 servers, 20 people, and a bunch of folders. No go. Right now, we can just hit five on the build, and we've got a new console up and running, even seconds. So, was it worth it, at least for us? Does the pros outweigh the cons? Does uh, common right, st right, right styling, central repo, uh, is it right and read function? And the fact that it's all PowerShell based, it isn't bound to TeamCity, you can use any CI tooling. Uh, does, it all, does it all the pros outweigh that the time and skills required to run that to uh, use Git? There are three commands, Git add, Git commit, Git push, and Git pull from time to time. And even knowing about CI CD tooling, uh, for 30 people there are three right now that manage and maintenance our team CT and that's enough for the whole support to use it. So yeah, that is a lot of good stuff and it's not that bad to start over. So if we were to summary and put five bullet points, what we think this gave us, this would be it. I don't know your time. Yeah, we run out of time. If you'd like to see any of additional things, we've got a demo for the naming scheme, what, how we name our functions, why does it work, how we create, how he created a template function. So right now, the employee has a lot of functions. And if a support requires, for example, a new mailbox, that's just a bogus function. We migrated from on-premise to, to, to cloud. And they require signing a new license. They don't have to figure it out. They just run new template, they got a new function body, and they have to put only a few lines of code into the function, commit it, and every logging, function, synopsis, whatever, is already in place. So even a low-level PowerShell user can create functions and increase the benefit of all the team. And uh, thanks to continuous uh, deployment, I'm not scared to deploy new function or update function, because uh, we, we, we use version, so everyone who are using right now functions don't feel anything. Yeah, any fear, we can roll back anytime we need. So if there are any questions, uh, any stuff you'd like to ask or anything you want to know about the, the CI tooling we're running. Yep. Yeah, sure, we'll do. Okay, so the question is, how did we persuade the management? Uh, it was a hard talk, but the thing is that when we needed that the most, we had like 30 people a month joining our company, and there were like 60 steps to deploy a new employee within the company. It took eight hours of a single man to incorporate a new employee into our company. So after uh, Martin came to us and he helped us with this, with the validation, with the HR, and the <laughs> steps that Tomek put into, because there was just a small number of like 20 steps at, at the beginning. But he taught us how to do that. Right now, a new employee with the machine deployment and putting on table is like an hour. Yeah, that helped. 30 people from eight hours, like 20, 240 hours a month into 30 hours a month. That helps a lot. The same was with Leaf employee, so we have no checklist for Leaf employee. As sometimes as, uh, the boss asks us, did you do that? Did you switch off the, uh, I don't know, license? Did you take uh, the PST from Outlook? And we never know. Uh, so n right now there are 60 steps on the Leaf employee checklist. And even with, if uh, one step it takes uh, five minutes, so we have 
three, we had 300 minutes. Right now, it took two, one hour. Depends on... Uh, and it's all been logged in into the SQL. So the thing is that we don't know because we don't track it. Support does it. Support just runs new, em new leave employee. That creates a whole file for them with all the steps, even manual steps. For example, grab the machine. So once he grabs the machine and brings it back to uh, reformat, all he has to do is just to run one line and it will update the status in the SQL database. So all the other team will know the computer has been taken off. So yeah, we don't know. We just look into the SQL database. And of course, we sometimes improve our function in home. Shh. To peepers. Yeah, to peepers, <laughs> basically. So yeah, that's it. Thank you.